Hello and welcome to Unsupervised Thinking, a podcast about neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and science more broadly. We are a group of people who study computational neuroscience. I'm Grace. I'm Josh. And I'm Connor. And the topic for this episode is Bayesian just so stories. It comes from a series of articles that we read. The idea being that some of the modeling used in neuroscience is kind of perhaps not as useful as some people are claiming it to be. And there was a controversy about this type of modeling work and its role in psychology and neuroscience. So we read this series of articles that started um, with one called Bayesian Just So Stories in Psychology and Neuroscience by Jeff Bowers and Colin Davis. And that was in 2012. And um, the next two articles that we read were first um, a group of people who were responding to this first article, and then after that, the uh, authors of the original article responded back. And so this is just like a little thread that happened in the research community around the topic of Bayesian modeling and psychology and neuroscience. So we should start by explaining, I guess, what Bayesian models are and how they're used in psychology and neuroscience, and then we can get into what exactly was being said in these articles. So I guess to elaborate slightly, the idea is that in psychology and neuroscience, you want to come up with theories that explain, in psychology, it's usually human behavior, usually in some kind of controlled well, often in some kind of controlled experiment, which could be like a perceptual experiment or a decision-making type of experiment. So people are performing some kind of task. And in neuroscience, you want to explain the behavior of neurons in the brain, maybe you know some measurement of the activity of neurons. So it could be in animals or it could be in humans if using like fMRI or EEG or MEG or these kinds of things. And so there's, a te- so there's this sort of maybe a, you could call it like a modeling framework um, which is the term that someone uses in one of these papers, which is kind of Bayesian. Um, and maybe we should explain what, just broadly, what Bayesian means for people who don't understand. Do you, someone want to do that? Sure. So, I mean, there are many different perspectives on this, and people argue about, you know, Bayesian probability and Bayesian statistics from a sort of philosophical perspective. But I think the simplest way to think about it, certainly like as a as a general introduction, is just there's probability, which is like how we compute the relative probabilities of things. And so there's like a whole branch of, let's say, math around how do you manipulate probabilities in the right way. So just like there's calculus or linear algebra, which is su- are subfields of math for how to manipulate certain kinds of mathematical concepts. Probability has an associated field of math with it. And if you are interested in doing certain kinds of computations with probabilities having to do with real data, Essentially, the standard mathematical framework for, for treating that is going to be Bayesian probability. Basically, if you, if you want to do modeling, where the, the models talk about probabilistic quantities, uh, kind of the agreement is, is if there's an interaction between these sort of probabilistic quantities and data, then it's, it's going to be Bayesian modeling. So we can, we can try to give like a concrete example of this. Yeah, I think uh, the like words, well, okay, I guess you were using words, but <laughs> you're using a lot of math words, so I'm going to yeah. use real words. Uh, the words way to describe this would be something like uh, a Bayesian approach gives you a way to combine different sorts of information in a messy world. You yes, know, there's some, yes, that's a good way of describing it. There's so it's uncertainty. Like you have noisy data. If there's yeah. like, if you have, if you have, if you have, uncertainty about certain quantities and you have noisy data the right way to combine those pieces of information is using bayesian uh bayesian computational tools and an example that comes from the first article in this series is if you are uh this was you know written by an academic and for an audience of academics so they say if you're walking around campus and you see someone from afar and you have some kind of perceptual evidence you're you're seeing this person but they're not close up to you, so there's some you know, uncertainty. You think it might be someone that you know. Uh, you might combine this kind of visual information that you're getting in this moment that you see someone who kind of looks like someone that you know with the knowledge that you have about how likely it is that that person would be on the campus. So if it's a fellow professor or a student, 
it seems very likely that they might be on the campus and you think that this person looks like them, so you might kind of strongly conclude that that is them. If it's someone that you knew from high school or, you know, your grandmother or something like that, someone who's unlikely to be on the campus, even though you're getting kind of a visual stimulus at the time that says that this person looks like that person you know. Only vaguely. Yeah, yeah, you're getting some small amount of input that says maybe this person kind of looks like someone I know. Your prior information about how likely it is for them to be there might make you conclude, but that's not them. And so this is the way in which uh, Bayesian uh, theories can enter into models of perception and decision making. It's a, the, a core concept is the idea that you're going to combine prior information that you have with current information that you're getting. Well, and it's, it's, it doesn't have to be just one combination, right? To be clear, I mean this, that that's like the right way of introducing it as like there's one combination. There's some prior knowledge, and then there's some in, there's some data that you get that's noisy, and you update your prior belief. But like kind of very complicated things can get bundled into this framework of computation, right? So like you could have some prior knowledge and then you see many different pieces of data and you combine all of those pieces of data or the prior that you have could be very weak and not informative and you could just get many different pieces of data. And as long as you have kind of credibility associated with each piece of data that you get, like how uncertain was each piece of data, then there's sort of a a calculus for how to optimally combine the different pieces of information weighted by their uncertainty. Yeah. And like another thing would be that we're kind of implicitly talking right now about, say, combining, you know, in Grace's example, combining a piece of information about perceptual information about the identity of a person with prior expectations over who in a given context you might expect to see and kind of combining those to give sort of a single output, which is your ex- the your uh, what you guess the identity of the person you're seeing is. You could also do things like you know, in fact, like usually um, you can compute, in fact, like so a whole probability distribution over outcomes. So you could, in this case, you could compute a probability distribution over um, identities. So it's like most likely that that person is Josh because it kind of looks like Josh and I know that Josh goes to this university or whatever that I'm on. But it could also be my friend Jan because he also has a beard and is hairy. But it's less likely to be him because he doesn't go to this university. But maybe I know that he's visiting New York, which is where I am or something. And I could say, oh, it's like, you know, probably 60% Josh. Maybe it's like 20% Jan and so on. So you can kind of, you can compute. That would be like the posterior. So it's like a distribution over outcomes or some variable that you're interested in. In this case, the identity, which arises from combining a prior over all the different identities plus um, sensory information that's bearing on on the question. Yeah, so the, the three main components are that you're combining this prior with the information that you're getting at the moment, which is usually called the likelihood, and then the thing you get from combining that is the posterior, which is like kind of what you now believe. That's kind of the outcome of you doing this this little computation in your head. And and the, it, core, the, the core intuition, though, is right, that all of these pieces of information have probability distributions associated with them. Yeah, exactly. So the prior is not just like a piece of information. It's like a distribution over possibilities. Yeah. The likelihood has an associated uncertainty with each piece of data that you get. And then the the, prob- the posterior is now your your whole answer, which is not, yeah, it's this, the probabilities associated with each outcome. Yeah, so as Connor said, you could have, you know, different kind of strengths of belief at, uh, associated with several different people after you did this conversation uh, uh, computation. You know, I'm 60% certain that that's Josh and 20% certain that it's Jan. And it's worth keeping in mind, well, uh, it's worth keeping in mind that the, in, in the sort of psychology and neuroscience literature, that, that, that style of experiment is what's going on, but that sort of tasks are, are, are very specific things. For example, you might be shown a sequence of oriented bars, like just like a vertical bar and then a bar at like, you know, 10 degrees to the vertical. So like pointing in, you know, like slightly towards the one o'clock on a clock position or something like this. And you would, you know, see these with pauses in between or something. And we, we, we'd be trying to like estimate detection thresholds for like, is it a different bar or is it the same bar that I just saw? So like, what's the resolution at which people can distinguish between these? So the kinds of tasks that psychiatrists or sorry, sorry, psychologists and neuroscientists are interested in tend to be these very sort of simple contrived, contr- often. contrived, but rigorously quantifiable examples. Yeah. It would be too messy. I think it's important. Yeah. It would be too messy to actually do like the campus experiment and see 
you know, what people think. They have to do it in a very controlled way in a lab. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I'll just mention this now. It'll come up more naturally when we start to- talking in more, like, more concretely about the papers, I think. But there's kind of another component of this framework, this kind of Bayesian um, framework for trying to explain human or animal behavior, which is, so, you know, so far we've talked about combining prior expectations o- over, um, so outcomes in, in some, you know, it's very general, it could be like a lot of different situations, but say priors over like identities of people you'll see on a campus in that, in that example, with likelihood, which is um, the information that you're getting from the from the data. So in this case, it'd be like sensory information of some kind um, to give this posterior distribution. So a updated sort of probabilistic belief about um, uh, who, who you're looking at. And another component that comes in then in terms of explaining behavior. So, th- so that kind of this framework in general is going to kind of be able to specify how you could or should combine different pieces of information. Um, but then in a particular task, you have to make, say, decisions or you have to actually, you know, combine this information has to result in behavior. So you have to move from the posterior. So you're, you're kind of your expectations that you've gotten from combining your priors plus data to doing something. And often in this framework, what you're going, the way that kind of you're going to uh, get from the information to the behavior is by having some kind of utility function. Um, so some kind of function that describes basically what the animal or person cares about in a particular situation, what they're trying to do. Um, and so you should, the idea is that, you know, animals, humans will be combining their expectations and using their expectations alongside some kind of notion of what they're trying to do to figure out what best to do, given the information that they have and what they want to achieve in vague terms. Um, so there's this notion of like a utility function, which is necessary for defining what we mean really by optimal yeah, in a so lot of situations. It's like the goal of what the yeah. behavior is for in some way. And also, I think right. it's uh, important to note that when we say like, oh, you see someone on campus and you're not sure who it is. And so you consider who you expect it to be and all that. That's uh, meant to be done automatically. It's not saying that you every time you make a decision or you kind of uh, receive a perceptual experience that you're consciously going through these steps, but somewhere in right. the brain, these things are happening automatically based on your brain's expectations and the information that it's getting. Yeah, actually, just to make the utility function idea the goal just more concrete, like to extend our example, maybe when you're on campus and you're sort of looking around, maybe you're, um, you know, there might be different costs associated with different types of mistakes. So, you know, it might be very much a bad idea to say, like, say there's someone that you've had like a terrible fight with or whatever, and you don't, you really don't want to bump into them. It might be very bad for you to guess that the person you're seeing is not them when in fact it is, but it might not be as bad to, oh shit, does that example not work? No, it works. It works. (laughs) Oh, it does? Yeah. If you don't Uh, want to run into them. And there's someone who kind of looks like them, you might as well just uh, kind of, you know, not risk it. If you have any, if your posterior distribution gives you any, you know, possibility that it's them, you should avoid them if that's your utility function. And so the behavior won't necessarily reflect, you know, the behavior will just be, do you go towards them or away from them? And so in order to map the posterior distribution onto a behavior, you need to kind of know why am I making this behavior? If I am not willing to risk any possibility of seeing this person, then even if my posterior gives me very low probability that it's then, I'm still going to avoid. So to interpret the behavior, you need to know the utility. Also on like a much higher cognitive level, I remember when I I took a class that uh, kind of talked about Bayesian learning and Bayesian theories for cognitive science uh, in undergrad. And after that, that was the first time I had heard about it. And after that, you could like you can see this everywhere, like kind of in your thinking and in behavior, this idea that you're combining your prior information with, you know, uncertainty about what's happening right now. And so it kind of does appear a lot of places, this framework. And so or it certainly becomes I think for people who are who are well versed in thinking about things in a Bayesian way, 
it, it seems like a useful convention for clarifying uh, for clarifying your thinking about a certain problem. And this is going to come up in this argument. But I mean, if you know, if you're trying to figure out like, well, so what was happening in the situation? It just becomes sometimes a useful way of structuring your thought, like intuitively. Well, I had some background information, and then I got some noisy data. And then I made this decision because I made some inference based on combining those things. And, you know, people obviously, I mean, so it's, a, it's an open question empirically whether in a given case people actually combine information in an optimal fashion. That's something that's actively studied and, and we'll get to. But, um, but just the sort of as a useful convention for formalizing yeah. certain notions, it can be useful. I mean, just as a, a kind of note on that point, right? Is that, and this was going to come up. We'll talk about this. Um, this is kind of part of one of the criticisms that's made in the first paper. Is that when a a way of thinking is kind of flexible enough, it can be possible for it to kind of explain anything or something. Will be one of the criticisms, right? And so, and I think that's actually like we'll go through the, it in detail. But it's worth you know bearing in mind that. The fact that something kind of seems intuitively appealing very frequently, it's kind of ambiguous what that says. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a little risky. Well, but I think this gets back to the sort of unreasonable effectiveness of math, um, mm. right? There, there's a sense in which using probability theory to, to like understand how things are working, right? There's uncertainty in the world and you can quantify it. I mean, this is essentially what statisticians do. Any way mm-hmm. that you can rigorously think about problems involving uncertainty is going to boil down to probability. And I think, like, Bayesian has a certain connotation, but, like, clearly the right way to think about uncertain quantities that you want to combine and reason about is in terms of combining their probabilities in the right way. And so, yeah. uh, on some level, it, like, you know, when, when, when we're interested in talking about Bayesian modeling, to me, it's largely synonymous with just using, like, saying you want to do probabilistic modeling. You want to talk about uncertain quantities and uncertain data, and you want to, to figure out how to how to handle that in a coherent way. Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, so, we're so going to let, so get into so let, let's, let's get to, let's get to this let's get to this first paper at this point. I mean, sure. the so the, the basic thesis, and we can try to break down some of the points. But the basic thesis mm-hmm. is that in psychology and neuroscience, when people try to build models that use a sort of Bayesian framework, let's say. Or, or and they'll refer to this sometimes as Bayesian models, and we have to we, we want to distinguish. So I'll try to use the clear language just from the outset, which is like using you know probabilities and Bayesian computation is sort of a framework in the sense that like you specify specific models. Like I think in this specific setting, like looking at a person across the street or looking at a particular oriented bar or something like this. A person is going to, uh, uh, you know, a person or a monkey or an animal or whatever, when they're looking at this kind of stimulus, is going to do a certain kind of thing in order to perceive it. And they're going to combine their sort of background information with the observations they get. And this is sort of just the language in which you specify a specific model. So like saying that you want to do it as a probabilistic model just says there's going to be a probability over the sort of background information they have and a probability that is inherited from the noisiness of their perceptual apparatus and that they're going to do some combination of that. And there's different levels of assumptions we can make. But the, but the basic thesis of the the criticism of this approach is that it's, it's too flexible. You can basically come up with just-so stories whereby anything that an organism is doing is optimal under a certain set of assumptions. I think we should get into optimal. Optimal too? An okay. important word that's used sure. a lot. So when so yeah so the, this first article is setting forth to kind of uh, convince people that all of this Bayesian modeling and stuff you know labeling the brain as Bayesian or behavior as Bayesian is kind of overstating uh, the the claims like there's there's going beyond what can be said based on the work that's being done and part of it is that people do these tasks where they then try to kind of uh, use Bayesian math to be able to explain the performance of the animal on the task. And if the performance of the animal kind of is explainable by a Bayesian model, they'll say that the animal is behaving optimally. 
because this Bayesian model says this is what they should do. This is how this information should be combined. And then that's what the animal is doing. And so the animal is being optimal. Okay, so, so what does optimal mean even more precisely in this setting, right? So in just in the, in the, in the formalism, if you make assumptions about what the prior distribution is, so like in some experiment, I, I mean, I guess like, yeah, a, a good psychophysical experiment that everyone's probably encountered is like a tone test. Like what kind of frequency can you hear to like check your hearing? I don't know. We did this in school when I was a kid, right? So like you'd, you'd hear like tones in a headset and people would say, make a, make some sort of indication when you hear a sound. You know, you might make a false alarm. Like, what if you think that there's going to be like a tone? I mean, I, I think maybe I was kind of paranoid and did this as a kid. You know, there's like, <laughs> there's like, you think like, oh, they're giving me a tone every like few seconds or something like this. So when I don't hear a tone, like maybe you kind of hallucinate a tone or something like this. Uh -huh. This would be because you have like some sort of prior expectation. You didn't want to let down the test. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that there's, that there's like, that there's like, you, you think that there's going to be a tone and then. You say, yeah, I think there was a tone because you, you made, like, you're essentially making up the fact that because you were expecting it. And it may not be like a cognitive thing where, like, you're trying to, like, please the experimenter, though that could be a, a consequence. It could be, like, an honest psychological thing where, like, you're kind of expecting to hear a tone. And so since the tones can be very faint, you know, maybe you hallucinate the fact that there actually was a tone. And that would be an example of, like, a false positive by using a Bayesian yeah. kind of model. But so, like... I mean, people, like, like illusions, right? Illusions are, are common. Kind of, yeah. People use illusions often to describe this Bayesian idea. So, I don't know. Yeah, so like, you know, you might see something that isn't there or you might confound some kinds of things that are in the visual. So community. one of the examples that they give in this article is a study that uh, says that if you're looking at something visual, but the contrast is low. So if the contrast is low, it's kind of like weaker. It's harder to see it a bit. Um, and you're looking at something that's moving if the contrast is low, it appears to be moving slower than it actually is. And the mm -hmm. mechanism that was put forth for why this is, is that when the contrast is low, the information you're getting at that time is weak. And so you're very uncertain about it. So when you're uncertain about the information you're getting at the time, then you rely more on your prior. And if you have a prior that says most things don't move that fast, uh, then you're going to conclude that this is probably moving fairly slowly. So that was an example. So this is, yeah. So there you go. That's a good example. It's, it's worth example. maybe it's worth clarifying that even further, just so there's a very concrete example that we can Keep refer to. Sure. I mean, so like right, the idea is you're looking at things moving on a screen, and you have to estimate the speed of the things moving on the screen. So, in this case, in the very the idea formal is that, sense, you have a prior over speeds of things on screens. Exactly. Yeah. You have a prior over th speeds of things on screens. That's the prior. The likelihood is something about the sensory inputs. And the idea is that in the experiment, this, the object moving will be darker or brighter. Or the contrast of the image you're looking at will be higher or lower. And the assumption of the experimentalist is that when you increase the contrast, you reduce the uncertainty in the sensory information. So you make the sensory information like a better source of information. And so when you then um, combine them and estimate the When speed. you combine the likelihood, when you combine the likelihood and the prior, the, the relative uncertainties in the likelihood and the prior will determine which source of information you put more weight on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when the when when there's high contrast, you have low uncertainty in the in the likelihood, you think this is really good sensory information, and I'm gonna weight that heavily relative to my prior expectations. Essentially but ignoring the, the contrast prior is, is the contrast. Ignoring the prior, yeah. right. But when the scent when the contrast is low, you think, um this the, there's a lot of uncertainty here. The sensory input is not that good. I'm going to more heavily rely on my prior. And so the idea is that in the low contrast situation, by looking at people's decisions, you should be able to reveal something about their prior expectations. And, and I, want to, I want to speak one more point about the, the, the sort of normative background of this, which is that the math itself, if you make concrete enough assumptions, the math gives you a right answer. It gives you the, like, in this case, it gives you the optimal weighting of prior data and sensory information. Because it, it is the case that if your sensory information is very noisy, you shouldn't trust it that much. So even if the... Uh, so there's like a right answer. When we say shouldn't here, we mean that according to the math, right, combining the prior and the likelihood... 
there's like a right answer. So this is why this is this is why it's important to explain what optimal means in this sense yeah. because when you say the animal or the person in this study is behaving optimally, it doesn't mean that they're accurate all the time because they are yeah. saying that yeah. this movement is slower than it actually is. So they're but wrong, given, but they're yeah. wrong in a way that is like optimal. Yeah, According given the, the fact the that they math. were given yeah. uncertain information, they are behaving reasonably according to this Bayesian model. So they're saying that they're, they're behaving optimally because they were given uncertain information. And so, like to spell out to spell out the 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 criticism a little bit more, the 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 assertion that something that behavior is optimal depends, like we just said, on kind of. So if you have very concrete assumptions, if you set up the prob- the the, uh, the model very explicitly, you can compute what the optimal thing to do is. But the optimal thing to do, there like it follows right that the optimal thing to do depends on your assumptions. So concretely, if you you have to make an assumption about what the prior is that the animal holds and how we strong that ac- prior is sometimes, and how strong sometimes. that prior is, we can't we can't access this. Okay, so for example, if we you know. Say, if we assume that animals have a prior that things in general tend to move fast, then when the contrast is low, we'll predict that they will that they will overestimate the speed of things. overestimate the speed of the of the objects. If we assume that their prior is that things tend to move slowly, then in the exact same experimental setting, when the contrast is low, we'll now be predicting the opposite thing, which is that they'll be underestimating the speed of the object. And so, like, it, it's actually plausible. And, I mean, in some cases, the way the analyses end up going is something like you, you sort of optimize the you optimize the whole setting to explain the data. and As optimal. You, you, of. you optimize the whole setting to explain the data as optimal, yeah. So, like, yeah. You, you kind of are... are estimating what the prior must have been to explain the behavior but then yep. the, the, sort of that 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 sounds like you're doing something that's a fallacy but i the, i think the and that we're gonna i'm kind of getting at one of the defenses which is there's an explanatory power to that though right like at the end of the day you could say like one explanation for why the the uh, or at least it feels like there's an explanatory power one explanation for why the guy seems to be underestimating the speed when there's low contrast is because he had a prior that was saying that things don't move. And that becomes part of the explanation itself. It's like you explored the different possibilities of what kinds of models could have explained that behavior. But the the sort of outcome was what the model was that was able to describe the behavior is itself the conclusion. But that that is definitionally a just-so story in some sense. Right. It's like at the end of the day, retrospectively, without making subsequent predictions, you can explain a certain finding. Any behavior can be explained in terms of some sort of probabilistic model. And I guess that's basically the the criticism in spirit. Yeah. So if you don't have any other reason aside from this experiment you did with low contrast moving stimuli to believe that your subjects have a prior that favors low moving stimuli that suggests that most things move slowly, uh, there's you're just you're just making that up so that your model will fit the data and so to then kind of sell that as oh look these subjects perform optimally in this motion estimation task is it doesn't seem like you're being fully honest if you phrase it as, as a disclaimer we're not picking on any particular paper we're no. kind of <laughs> we're kind of giving a cartoon version of what one of these psychological findings could be sold as and this is kind of just part of what this initial article was um complaining about in a way is that it doesn't it's not fair or it's not even uh necessary or interesting to say that people are behaving optimally in these settings because what you're really saying is i found a model that explains their behavior and that's it and so the interesting thing is well what are the properties of that model and what does it tell us about cognition the fact that uh the model and the data match it, that's just what you set out to do was to find a model that matches the data I mean, maybe this is jumping slightly ahead. Uh, a kind of takeaway feeling I had from reading these papers is is that, I mean, we'll have to get on to kind of what's the alternative to this Bayesian approach that, you know, maybe the guy writing, the people writing this paper kind of might advocate or suggest at least. Um, but I, I come away with this impression that in a way, you know, we're studying these very sort of, we're studying kind of very complicated subjects. I mean, say animals or human beings that can do a lot of things 
and we're trying to explain a very limited set of behaviors, usually like very contrived behaviors where we're kind of assuming away a lot of things that are probably con- contributing, like the history of the animal or all of the other things that they can do and so on. So, I mean, to me, this it ends up feeling like this debate over what the right framework is is kind of largely arising out of a, a sort of unconstrainedness of what we can so far study relative to what we would like to be able to explain in a way. I mean, we're trying to say, oh, people are doing sort of optimal Bayesian things, but it's, you know, it's such a huge, it is such a hugely flexible framework that people might be optimized for some very specific kind of a huge kind of array of interacting types of tasks and they might be able to change over time and so forth. So, the, but I think that you know, this can somehow apply to sort of any current theory of cog- of cognition or behavior. I mean, there's so just like I, a, I, I mean, I, I want to jump the gun a little bit. So I think we should, we should concretely lay out some more about what the criticisms are concretely, but at the yeah. same time, yeah, I mean, I think in the background, and I mean, maybe I'm, I'm projecting too much, but to me, there's, there's some elegance that motivates the use of like Bayesian framework, uh, beyond like actually making the concrete claims. So like, yeah. if it's the case that you look at some behavior and you think, I want to build a model of that. If you want that model to be probabilistic, essentially the kind of modeling framework you're going to use is going to kind of overlap or basically be what people refer to as Bayesian modeling. You're going to say, mm-hmm. here's this behavior. I want to explain it in terms of a probabilistic model. That that means you're in the Bayesian camp, basically, by default. And, like, there's a there's an intellectual aesthetic sort of elegance to the Bayesian framework that allows you to separate out conceptually different pieces of information in a useful way and compute rather hard quantities in a sort of known optimal way, at least approximately, right? Like... We know if you specify the prior and you specify the likelihood, we know how to do the computation, at least approximately, for like kind of a very wide range of problems. And at this, and, and moreover, like these tools are sort of clear. So like they're, they're not just like they, they're, they sort of allow you to express these things, but they're also like scientifically accessible in that the knowledge is separated out in a certain way. So like, while things like neural networks are being very, very widely used and are useful in like data science settings where you want something that can predict something well, like from, from a scientific standpoint, if you want to have like a clear separation between different causes that combine in a certain way, like the probabilistic inference framework or like using Bayesian probabilistic inference is a very kind of rigorous and, and yet at the same time clear way of computing rather complicated quantities, certainly mm-hmm. for the, of the scale that's used in these kinds of settings. I think it can be hard to appreciate if you haven't tried to do science, these kind of motiv- modeling motivations that you're talking about. Um, but it's like, the question, yeah, in the background is like, what questions is it interesting to make or useful to make about a behavior? If you're hmm. observing some behavior and you want to characterize it as a scientist, the, the, like what seems natural to, I think, many people is to like build a model that explains why that behavior arised mm-hmm. or arose, arose. Um, <laughs> and you so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna look at the behavior and you're gonna try to come up with some math or some theoretical framework which explains where that behavior came from, and once you know where that behavior came from, you can make predictions about what other behavioral consequences will follow, and there are yep. many frameworks you could probably use. So like th- this gets back at this question like what other frameworks are there? You could you could use like a neural network for example to explain the behavior. Mm-hmm. Right. But it becomes a question then what kinds of predictions can you make? Uh, and like I think the Bayesian this is another one of the defenses like the Bayesian framework does have a certain clarity to it. I mean I think coming back to the speed estimation problem is 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 useful here. So in the first paper the you know the critical paper the paper critical of the Bayesian uh, modeling kind of uh, approach uh, at the last part of the section where they talk about this first paper um, about speed estimation they sort of talk about this idea that the prior is not it's they don't check if the prior um, is kind of reasonable quote unquote so but this is a very concrete type of prediction that these models actually make so you fit the behavior and part of the way you part of the way you fit your model like you adjust the parameters of your Bayesian model 
to explain the behavior. Part of doing that is adjusting the parameters of the prior. Um, but once you've done that, you are actually making a prediction about the kind of priors that the animals have. It's very difficult to access the priors that animals have. It, it would be diff- like it's hard to know how to do that. I mean, you can well, do no, more behavioral like, yeah, experiments. So you did different experiments that also yeah. required a shared prior. Then, like, yeah, that includes some of the information. If, if two experiments that you did, like, if you did two experiments that had different behaviors that you thought relied on a shared prior, and they gave yeah. different estimates about what the parameters of the prior are, that would be contradictory. That would be contradictory, theory. and you would say, "Well, that wasn't a very good explanation." Yeah. Another another thing that you can do is you can kind of make this other this other assumption, which is that presumably, if animals have priors over certain types of quantities, it probably should be related to what you see in the world um yeah and so for example if you predict as they do in this case that animals have a prior to perceive things as moving slowly i mean it's not there's ways of there's ways that this might not necessarily be the prediction but you know naively the prediction is things move things have a bias towards moving more slowly in the real world right um, and a lot of people do do this. So they, they, he's, he's criticizing the authors of this paper for not measuring the distribution of speeds of mo- moving objects in the world. But there is a, a lot of people who do this kind of Bayesian work, um, Bayesian kind of psychological or neuroscientific work. They look at do the, the natural thing. statistics distributions of various right. stimuli. So, like, so the question would be, like, is it reasonable to have a prior that objects move slowly? Yeah. And if, if you go and measure. If, if you're talking about humans in a city, maybe they're. They see a distribution of things that move faster than people who live somewhere else. But if you live, you know, on a rural college campus or something like this, you might. Yeah, where everyone's just moseying around drinking. <laughs> that tea. wasn't what I was thinking. I was just thinking there aren't like cars like flittering by all the time. But, right. <laughs> I mean, certainly when you're like when you're looking out at nature, you will see occasional rapid movements, like a bird flying by or something like this. But mm-hmm. most of what you're looking at is static, and that I mean that. So it becomes complicated, right? It's yeah, focal it, it, the, things but that's the point: is that yeah. it's hard to get at these things. Yeah. Um. So, you know, maybe you the you the only thing you can do is to give behavioral tests and see if they all give you the same estimate of what the prior is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But okay. we should kind of uh, carry on with what the the yeah. arguments against so, so this are. Grace, why don't you yeah more concretely summarize the whole? Display. Yeah. So, um, as we said, they complain that uh, you can build these models in any way you like and then therefore get a model whereby the animal's behavior was optimal and you can do that by as we said kind of just deciding what the prior is or fitting the prior to the data which they consider you know a just so story you can also play with the utility function which as we said kind of describes the goal of the behavior and is a way of mapping the posterior to uh, behavior and the example they give for that is it was observed that goalies in soccer or football, depending on what continent you're on, they actually just what country. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyways, in this sport, when people have penalty kicks, the goalies have a habit of kind of anticipating which direction the person will kick in before they even start to do it. So they're kind of just making a guess and go all out in one direction. Whereas if they just waited to actually see where the person, like, you know, wait until you actually see the the ball start to move and then go, they have a a better chance of actually blocking the goal. And so it seems like they're doing something that's irrational. And a way that you can, in a Bayesian framework, explain why they're doing this is to say that their goal isn't actually to block the most balls necessarily. But as part of their utility function, they have a desire to appear like they're trying really hard. And so (laughs) then if they like, you know, move very quickly and go all out in one direction, then it's like clear that they were giving it a go. Whereas if they tried to wait to see where it goes and then are too slow to respond, it seems like maybe they were being lazy. So if you change what kind of the goal of being a goalie is, uh, then you can explain this behavior. So this is something that they considered a little ridiculous in this original article. Then they also make the point that it's unclear if these theories can be falsified. So how would you prove the people doing this modeling wrong in any way? Uh, And they also complain that uh, these uh, Bayesian models and their ability to fit uh, behavioral data aren't usually compared to 
other models to say that the Bayesian model actually is better at fitting the data than a non-Bayesian model would be for the same data. And I think these points kind of, uh, to expand on the, the second two points, we should talk about the different types of Bayesian neuroscientists that they list, just because uh, we've been talking mostly about just using Bayesian math to model behavioral data, but there's actually kind of different layers to uh, what people use this Bayesian math for, or what they are uh, saying when they say that the, bain- the brain is Bayesian or something like that. Mm-hmm. So the three categories that they give are extreme Bayesian neuroscientists, who they say... Um, Which, I mean, like, yeah. We, extreme <laughs> radical Bayesian neuroscientists. There's a little bit of an over-categorization going on here, but uh, fine. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, fine. This is the, these are the categories that they want to yeah, use yeah. in this paper. Yeah. So. so they say extreme, which I think they say, like, these people don't really exist, or there's very few of them, but, you know, I mean, that's why they're the extreme. Um, but they say that these are people who say you can only understand the brain at a descriptive level. Like, the only thing we can do is explain behavior via these kind of high-level mathematical models, and to try to, like, know what the brain is doing deeper than that is, you know, a fool's errand, I suppose. A fool's uh, errand. <laughs> all of neuroscience is a fool's <laughs> No, I'm, yeah. <laughs> that was not a direct quote. <laughs> Uh, the next category. I want to write that in my, in a paper, like at, you know, like in the discussion <laughs> section. Such and such a branch of neuroscience is, consists of fools, errands solely. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the yeah. next category is methodological, uh, and that is people who say that uh, these these Bayesian models are just a way to describe behavior, and that's useful. You know, it's it's useful to have a framework and uh, mathematical equations that can tell us how animals are behaving in different circumstances and this can constrain any other models that we want to build about how the brain works because they have to still produce behavior that fits in with this model and then the third category is theoretical bayesian uh neuroscientists who say that bayesian behavior uh is inconsistent with non-bayesian heuristics so what they mean there is that if we observe that the behavior can be fit by these bayesian models then that kind of means that the brain itself is implementing the Bayesian math that we use to describe these models. Whereas you could imagine that there are kind of ways to get the same outputs, even if the brain is not in some way implementing this math that we use to produce those outputs. And so they'd be using uh... heuristics of some kind that in the domains that we've tested still look Bayesian, but they're not actually... Like the brain itself isn't representing these different distributions and combining them in the way that we do when we calculate posteriors and that kind of thing. This seems very confused to me. Yeah, so I agree. So I think the cat. Well, I mean, we sh- maybe we should we should summarize the last two major points of the paper real quick. Maybe. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So given that they talk about can these things can these theories be falsified? And I didn't. I don't know that I fully understood their argument about why these particular, like, why Bayesian models more than anything else couldn't be falsified. It seemed like they were saying that they don't make um, as many predictions as some other models, but I think that they were comparing these Bayesian level, or these uh, Bayesian descriptions of behavior to more mechanistic models of what, like, actual neurons and brain areas are doing. And so if you are going to put forth what you think the actual mechanism behind the behavior is, then, yeah, you're going to probably get some more precise, you know, situations where different mechanisms will lead to different outputs if you're putting forth a high-level theory that's just meant to describe the behavior and not explain how it comes from the brain in a mechanistic way, then, yeah, you you won't have as precise of, uh, like, predictions for the future but that's not a thing that's particular to bayesian models that's just behavioral modeling generally it's the level of the model yeah, it's like yeah. if you're not doing neural modeling then you're not going to make predictions about neurons i mean so i think i think we're all coming at this from a perspective of we we think that a lot of these critiques are confused i have some things to say in defense of it but i just want to f- i think we should finish summarizing the, the major points so basically some other some other major points are how that like if you're t- talking about this mechanistic version of it where like the brain is supposed to actually implement bayesian computations there isn't much empirical evidence in the scientific literature for that um yep. so that that's another kind of point that's made 
And then they have another subsection on conceptual problems with the Bayesian approach to studying the mind and brain, which uh, I think is sort of their miscellaneous category where they, they throw in all their other perspectives on uh, on, on why this this isn't working, but I, I think so. I mean, I, I think at a, at a high level, they are, are are missing. I think there's a, there's a legitimate concern, and then these people tried to form a, a full criticism of, of Bayesian methods, but it doesn't seem like these authors fully like get what's going on with. So the, the legitimate concern, is, and I think it's basically like there are overstatements in the literature, as far as I can tell, on the scope of what. Bayesian modeling is actually telling you. Yeah, and this is definitely true. Clearly true. Yeah, yeah. And and people, that comes back in the response to the response. It does. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and people will talk about optimality kind of without grounding it. And it a lot of this just feels though like the way scientists tend to oversell the conclusions that they have. I don't know. I think because it's not there. It's almost that the statement is the opposite of what the science was. If you title your paper humans are optimal in such and such that is not the finding of your work yeah, i object to that yeah, yeah. No, the I, finding I of your you. work I, is humans have a prior that favors yes. slow motion or whatever Complete, it is completely and agree. so it doesn't because yeah. usually when normal scientific over, overstatement is just like kind of going a step beyond in the direction of your work this feels like they flipped the direction of the work i agree so so it it, it does seem to me that there is something poorly conceived of the way findings related to Bayesian modeling are advertised um, yeah. or, or promoted, right? And I, I think maybe we all agree on that outright. Yeah, I think I agree. But at a deeper level, like using, again, the sort of Bayesian calculation system to, to, to make probabilistic models and compute quantities about probabilistic models seems like a reasonable thing to do. It seems well founded, and it doesn't really seem in conflict with a lot of the other things that go on. It it seems mostly mm. about how it's presented. So, like, if you if you want to say, are there non Bayesian models that explain something? This just kind of gets at the notion, like, okay, there's implementation details, and yeah. right. So, like, and, and, and this is not to you know dismiss everything as implementation details, but it's like, it, it, whichever one comes out first is fine. If if you find some non Bayesian modeling, which like an example would be using a neural network to do something. Right is non Bayesian generally, um, mm -hmm. so like you know I'm going to have a neural network that can like predict a certain quantity that matches with a human's behavior or something like this in a certain task. You would say, well, that's a non Bayesian approach that explains the behavior. So my alternative to the Bayesian approach is that like a neural network based approach explains human behavior better than a Bayesian approach. It's like this comparison seems totally artificial. In reality, you could interpret the computation go performed by the neural network as something that's kind of approximating a Bayesian approach. Yeah, because what if really someone just, just gave frameworks. me yeah. if someone just gave me that neural network and said, describe what it's doing, I would say, well, well, it seems to match a Bayesian model. I can make a Bayesian model that will describe what this neural network is doing. If they can both explain the behavior equally well, then you could probably yeah, do there's that. A f right. There's a funny thing here where what we're saying kind of sounds like a criticism of the Bayesian thing, right? Which I think it kind of lies at, I think, part of, the heart of at least part of the confusion or the conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is that, you know, it's like, um, I think, and I think maybe the framework versus model distinction was, is very yeah, relevant exactly. here. Yeah. So you they can't, this, and uh, they, they talk about this in the, the response to the, to the first paper talks about this. Like, you can't falsify, so the claim is things are not falsifiable because because of what we're talking about, you can like often interpret whatever behavior as Bayesian in some sense by manipulating things correctly, right? So that seems like a criticism. So it's not falsifiable. But the point is, you can't falsify an in you, you do not falsify an entire framework. Yeah, you have to like posit I mean, if we thought about specific like, models exactly, and then you can if, attempt if we to about show like whether math. or not those models are useful. I think think about it just like even more broadly with math. Yeah, right. You can't falsify the use of mathematics in science. It's yeah. just a meaningless statement. It's like it's like, oh well, I had I had a model, like the model that I'm talking about is that like this thing happens for some qualitative reason that I'm only gonna describe in words. And mm -hmm. if you try to put a mathematical model to it and my verbal description is has better predictions for some reason that it seemed hard, hard to imagine, uh yeah. then then like the math, like you, the use of math is falsified. No, it just means that the particular 
math that you used was was not correct, but it doesn't mean like the whole endeavor of trying to mathematize it is. There is a subtlety, right, of course, which is that when, because it's human beings who are actually doing the modeling, we are like flawed social creatures, okay, who, for example, like we already said, are trying to, you know, get grants and impress other people and so on and oversell things. It can be that like this nice clean theoretical kind of distinction that we're talking about saying, well, this is a framework. I posit a specific model. I draw certain conclusions from that model. I make predictions, kind of iterate the process and so on. It doesn't always work that cleanly in practice. So for example, right, you make the statement like Grace was saying, I did this Bayesian thing. And then you make a statement like, which shows that humans are optimal. In, In making that statement about optimality without kind of the relevant sort of without the details, you're actually kind of buying into the framework picture, I think. You're kind of saying the Bayesian framework has been has been shown to be like correct, which I think is the flip side of, of the erroneous the argument yeah. that you can't falsify the framework. Yes. So you the, also shouldn't the, sort of The framework can neither it. be correct nor incorrect. The Bayesian right. framework is not true or false. It's just right. like an approach to, to formulate specific models. In. And a specific model can be true or false insofar as it describes the behavior well or not yeah okay so so i mean we've we've summarized some of the 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 major criticisms actually gotten at a lot of the responses are there any sort of core responses uh that we didn't address that we think are relevant to to mention yeah i mean i think the uh people who wrote the response griffiths charter norris and puget are people who were kind of cited in the original article and so naturally they uh, <laughs> they had a desire to defend themselves. And mm. I mean, interesting, uh, interestingly, a lot of the responses along the lines of like, uh, basically, they just don't think that they were characterized correctly. It's not the case that they disagree with the criticisms. They just don't think that the criticisms are, are, are true. They're not accurately capturing the work that they've done. For example, the, we talked about these three different levels of, of Bayesian neuroscientists and the methodological one is the one that just says that this framework is a useful way to describe behavior, and then we can use that description of behavior in future work. They claim that that's kind of the only one that exists, and the people who claim that the brain actually has to be implementing the type of math that we use in in Bayesian modeling, uh, that they don't feel like anyone really stands by that claim. And so it it lends itself to kind of a more moderate description of, of what Bayesian modeling in neuroscience is about. If they're just saying that it's useful as a way to describe behavior, that's kind of a, a statement that most people can agree on. I mean, an effect of choosing a certain framework to work in is that, you know, it shapes the way you think about things and it shapes what kinds of questions you're going to ask yeah, and what absolutely. kinds of answers you're going to look for. Um, and I think, I don't know, I guess I don't have a very sophisticated, in my own mind, kind of um, attitude to the question of, you know, is this Bayesian way of thinking net, like taking into account all of the sort of strange interactions that go on, like between a scientist's work and future work and the way you think and what you do and so on, is it in some way harmful? I mean, yeah, so the, given... I mean, right, of course, like, yeah, the weakness would be like, Bayesians care a lot about prior knowledge and uncertainty. And yeah. so they do lots of experiments that might be informative for that kind of thing. But maybe yeah. if you don't care Other about stuff. those things, yeah. it's like those experiments are really not informative. So there's like by a certain, you know, from a certain perspective that doesn't care about these kinds of things, all of the experiments that these Bayesian psychi- psychologists are doing are, are essentially uninformative because they're telling you yeah. about quantities that aren't particularly interesting unless you're you're, you're coming at it from a, the Bayesian framework. So, yeah, I mean, I think there, there's definitely a, a, a real risk uh, in terms of what priorities get shaped by by this, and I and I think you know the, the this is all pre the somewhat recent return of neural networks, and I think that there there is you know a little bit a vague amount of disconnect between the people who study like neural networks and the people who are super Bayesian at least in certain ways because yeah. uh, you know neural networks are less elegant kind it, of conceptually or clear somehow. yeah it's, it's harder to yeah. interpret what neural networks are doing than it is to interpret what a bayesian model is doing the fact that people prioritized uh, explanatory simplicity like or, or comprehensibility of the model itself presumably biases what kind of what kind of explanations they're willing to tolerate 
Yeah, and right. so one of the points that they make in the uh, response to the original article is that these models are trying to offer a why instead of a how. Like, why is behavior the way it is? Let's figure out what the animal is trying to optimize by fitting a model to it, and then we can interpret that model and say, well, clearly, you know, humans have these kinds of assumptions, and they're combining it with information in order to achieve this kind of goal. And I can infer all those things by building this model and fitting it to data. And so this, again, speaks to the idea that they're not trying to say how the brain is actually Mm -hmm. implementing these things. And the brain could be implementing things in any different way, as long as it leads to the same behavior. But then they ask this kind of interesting question, they kind of like pose this question to the authors of the original article that is cognitive science done as soon as we know the neural and cognitive mechanisms behind things? And they would say that it wouldn't be done even if you can... Uh, build you a know, robot that does the same thing. Yeah, even if you build a robot that uh, has the same behavior, you're still not answering why humans had that behavior in the first place. And they're saying that these models can answer that. And I don't know how I feel about that. I'm not very sympathetic to that argument. Yeah, yeah. because... I think that it is the case that even within a Bayesian framework, there's a lot of different ways to get the same behavior. So you could build many different Bayesian models that will produce the same behavior. And so can you get at a why or can you get, I guess, at a set of different possible answers to the why question? I think that there's a little bit of, uh, I mean, I I don't totally buy their parsing of the why-how distinction. Hmm. But I, I think that I'm reluctant to allow for a sort of I don't want to use mystical because no scientist is is going to you know is going to accept that as anything other than a slight. Um, hmm. But uh, there, the, if you if you lump a sort of ambiguously large number of questions into things that are like somehow still questions, even if you know how to mechanistically re-implement something. So like if you can build a model of a person, like a robot that acts just like a person. I don't really believe there's a sort of ambiguously large space of questions that are still interesting to answer about the way that that, uh, that agent behaves, uh, that, that, that person or that robot behaves. Like, there are things that you might want to understand about it, but it's not clear to me that those are like deep why questions or that those are somehow like of an arbitrarily large space that like should still exist. It's like you, there, there is an infinite set of questions you can ask about anything, like for any human behavior you can ask. I mean, there just are like sort of combinatorially an infinite set of questions you can ask, but that does not make them all worthwhile or interesting. While when we're so far from understanding how the brain does work, it, it does seem worth restraining people's scope to the questions that like a lot of people can agree on as being like, quite relevant to the advancement of like the sort of figuring out how the brain does work and not some amorphous space of like what are the reasons why the brain works the way that it does one thing that i uh, one concern that i do have about this kind of bayesian thing and this is a concern very much not on the level of doing one study especially if you're very clear about your conclusions and you don't uh, kind of commit these kind of probably socially motivated fallacies of like very much overstating your conclusions and so forth. A concern I have is, especially when it comes to the social sciences, right? Oftentimes we're we're studying extremely reduced situations, okay? So we're studying like, you know, make human beings making very, very simple decisions. And we can use a framework, say that's like a Bayesian framework or something, and we can make good concrete models um, in that framework. And those models can be great, like by all these kind of usual scientific measures of like they have clarity, they can be falsified, right? They make predictions, whatever. But then there's kind of this disconnect between that rather humble work, rather very concrete, quite humble. And I mean, there's, I'm not saying there is, but there's a potential disconnect between that and then these kind of somewhat grandiose sounding conclusions about like, that that almost are conclusions about kind of human nature or something like people are this type of optimal that type of optimal i'm not this is definitely not inherent to the approach it's just it's it's a kind of a yeah because it does seem it seems like so i'm totally in support of the idea that you know it's good to have 
accurate models that describe behavior, accurate descriptions of behavior. And to have accurate descriptions of behavior, you probably need to make a mathematical model. And that, that, those that mathematical it. models probably have to include probabilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. so uh, yeah. the Bayesian framework seems well suited for this. But the question is then what do you do with those descriptions of behavior? And to me, I would say, okay, well, now I want to build a neural circuit that can also produce that behavior so that I can understand how the brain leads to that behavior. For this field, there is the risk that they're just collecting these descriptions. They're just showing all the different ways in which you can describe behavior in a Bayesian way. And I don't know what the sum total of that is supposed to mean. Yeah. And I think, to be honest, I mean, this might be maybe sounds conspiratorial, but like, like on the level of looking at a whole literature or something, they're kind of like emergent themes that happen, you know, that, that kind of emerge, right? Um, so, so, sort of like notions of, and this is not so, um, this isn't this isn't really about the debate between like Bayesian approaches versus other modeling approaches. You could probably come up with similar criticisms of other other frameworks, depending on what those frameworks were. But, you know, there's just, I mean, this is like a general thing about like neuroscience and psychology that kind of bugs me generally, which is a lack of care in describing how limited what you're doing is and a kind of a, a certain level of willingness to not either be silent um, in terms of you know, cautionary tales, like not saying, oh, well, let's not jump to any conclusions, right? This doesn't mean anything particularly strong about real human behavior in like very complex situations and so on. That would be kind of a silence, which I think we should criticize. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and the, the other thing would be like people who are kind of almost, I mean, we, we know are these characters. About, there are these characters, yeah. yeah, there are bullish people. Yeah. And there are these characters like who are famous, I'm not going to name people, but like who go around writing books about like, oh, this is how human beings are. And it's just kind of like, Give me a break. I mean, sometimes you can you can state rather simple things that have been potentially you know have been somewhat overlooked or can't like some simple but useful conclusions about uh, human behavior that you can glean from like a whole psychological literature, and that's very valuable. But I don't know somehow a lack of caution and and sort of clarity about what is the level on which we're studying human behavior, and really how much can that relate to you know, real human behavior or social behavior, these kind of things. Um, yeah. I mean, my, my point is just that, like, in some way, you could be paranoid that the Bayesian thing makes people sound like kind of like this homo economicus type of thing or some more subtle version of that. This kind of, you know, I don't know, whatever. This is a, this is a concern that I have often when I, when I read these kinds of things. More in the decision making context and then in like perceptual obviously because like it doesn't really matter if our retina is uh basic it doesn't really say that much about like the economic behavior <laughs> anyway that was a bit of a rant oh. yeah it is important to note i guess that these models are used to describe both perceptual computations as well as decision making and memory and forgetting and everywhere all across the brain uh separate Bayesian models are used to explain. Okay, any parting thoughts? I don't know. A caution with respect to letting enter into the world a notion of human beings as like super rational and optimized. Sure. Yeah. And like neuroeconomics. I mean, this is a this is a thing now. You know, and it's like you know, you study someone doing some like ridiculous task in some lab. Right. Or some little game that they're playing with other people. And you say, oh, you know, the psychologists have shown and told us that, in fact, these kinds of things are these are the kinds of decision making rules that people use. And we'll just like plug that into our model. And now our model is like a OK and we can proceed like, I don't know, that shit is ridiculous. Anyway, it, it does seem to me that like while there are concerns about using a Bayesian modeling framework and I would say valid criticisms of the literature, the, the criticisms the criticisms really should be more about what you can make statements about, not about mm. the, the the utility or or legitimacy of the approach, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of clear that like Bayesian framework for like formulating models is consistent. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a mathematically derivable set of statements that you use to compute things. Yep. Yeah. It's it's like the the real concerns have to be about how interesting and useful the kinds of conclusions you get from this field are 
I agree. And I think there are some interesting things to be learned. I think we don't want the statements to be like overzealous in terms of what they're promoting. Yeah. But you are formulating, in some cases, very clear models about at least conceptually what's like the, the models are, are, are almost at the conceptual level, but they can be very clear. And so I do think there's a utility in that. I don't think that they necessarily get into mechanism. And, uh, you know, it's not clear if they're like sort of useful from an engineering standpoint in terms of engineering cognition. Um, but they, they are useful, uh, I think, for helping to organize how scientists think about the classes of problems that, or, that organisms face. I think it's always a good idea to critique a prominent tendency in thought in a scientific domain, like always, because, the, you know, you're just sort of saying, OK, fine, we're doing this kind of thing. Maybe there are other kinds of ideas that we're like ignoring because we're so focused on this way of thinking about it. I mean, that's one thing. And it results in interesting conversations like this where people have, to, I mean, I mean, the papers, right? I mean, it's not yeah, yeah. so often that 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 yeah, scientists good... step out of their like tendency of just doing the work that they're good at and actually right. engaging with people who don't even agree that that style of work is super worthwhile. It's nice yeah, for which those I think conversations is, to be had. So yeah, that that's very both good. sides can have at least a bit of an understanding of what's going on. So yeah, this this exercise of having these articles like actually in print and back and forth arguing about this topic, I think is just like a really nice thing to be able to read because this is uh, something that a lot of people pursue, this Bayesian modeling, and um, it is important to have you know open discussions about what its goals should be. And it's nice to see prominent scientists in the field openly discuss these things. I agree, yeah. Yeah. All right. See you next time. Hey, if you're still listening to this, you must really like us. So how about you go to iTunes or Stitcher and rate the podcast? Give us some feedback. You can also go to our website, unsupervisedthinkingpodcast.blogspot.com. You can comment on different episodes, or you could give us ideas for new topics you want to hear about. We would love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.